Okay. Mr. Kulinitz, thank you very much for joining us here. We're at the uh, European Geosciences Summit, uh, the General Assembly for 2011. And just yesterday, there were a number of presentations on the question of the different kinds of precursors in different domains of the electromagnetic spectrum, which we can use to hopefully at some point have a real, maybe even a forecasting capability for us. Um, anyway, let's discuss um, what you've been looking at. Why, why are electro, what is the significance of electromagnetic precursors to earthquakes? Okay, I uh, prefer uh, to talk not only on the electromagnetic precursors, but uh, uh, it is the earthquake preparation is a complex physical chemical process happening starting from the earth crust up to the atmosphere and ionosphere. And they have a uh, different kind of manifestations. Within the period, uh, we are talking now about the short-term prediction, so it is something like a few weeks up to a few days and hours before the seismic shock. And because it is this uh, process which is generally connects many factors, we try to find an approach which gives us opportunity to explain what is happening, why, why we see so many different variations or anomalies during this preparation period. The first reason is very natural. When you have release of energy, which is equivalent to several thousand of, of nuclear bombs, so it is impossible to store this underground and in the, in the one moment to release. The earth is a living uh, matter and uh, there are some processes storing of the stress and this stress should manifest itself in, in some parameters. So uh, the most natural is that when you have deformation, you have formation of cracks inside the crust, uh, you change the system of the gaze migration inside the earthquake. Because you, uh, you change the system of gaze migration. Gas migration. Gas migration. Uh, the, the main components of this is a CO2, helium, hydrogen, and a radon, which is a radioactive gas, which is a product of the, the, the decay of uranium. It present everywhere, you know, that, uh, for uh, sanitarian purposes, uh, when you build your house, you make the monitoring of radon to be safe in your house. It is a heavy, odorless gas, but uh, it was detected many, many years ago that its release increases before the earthquake because this gas migration carries this radon and water coming up to the Earth's surface aquifer. Probably you have seen the um, video from Japan showing like, uh, uh, like a water going up during and before the earthquake. So water also carries radon with it. And now starts uh, the very interesting process which, which is characteristic for, for many, many natural events. For example, uh, you know uh, that uh, now the variations of the cosmic rays are associated with the formation of the cloud, cloud coverage of our planet. Why? Because the cosmic rays produce ionization of water, the ions become the centers of condensation, condensation of the water vapor. Water vapor condenses on ions and you obtain the nucleation, uh, which is the center of condensation for formation of clouds. 
the same is happening with coming of radioactive uh, matter of radon on the ground surface, close to the ground surface because radon is very heavy. It also produces ionization of air, ions become the centers of condensation and forms the large clusters, this ion and envelope of, of many, many water molecules. Yeah, you mentioned in your presentation yes. the ionization process and the hydration. Hydration. Hydration, yes, because it is not pure condensation, because people who know physics very well uh, should say that it should be saturation vapor to have condensation. But hydration does not need saturation. In any level of humidity, relative humidity, air, you will have the hydration in the ions. So, 30 percent of humidity, still you will have hydration of ions. And when ions become, uh, when uh, molecules of water become too attached to the ion, they release their free energy when they were in air, which is named latent heat. And this is latent heat is the source of the thermal energy which is registered just over active tectonic faults. It could be monitored by the satellites. They show very nice the configuration of the active tectonic faults during the period of pre preparation of the earthquakes. You, we are talking about a about few weeks before the earthquake. We have activation of the tectonic plate where epicenter is situated. So we can see the heating of the borders between the tectonic plates and active tectonic faults. This is the smaller structures. So starting from the ground surface, we see the thermal anomalies along the active tectonic faults, which manifestates that we have release of radon along the tectonic faults. And the geophysical perspective shows that we have a peaks and maximum of radon concentration over tectonic faults. They are sources of the radon coming from the ground. So uh, the first level, it is ground surface. Then this heat starts to be uh, accumulating and because you have temperature difference between the fault and the area outside the fault so it starts the mixing due to uh, temperature difference you have the horizontal motion and convection motion because the, the heat of air tries to go up and it is transformed into some called small spirals Chirality is formed, the, and these small chiral uh, uh, structures tend to merge. It is uh, in the theory of chaos. It's named this reverse cascade instability. They merge and form the large thermal spot, which would be registered in the upper layers of atmosphere. And uh, simultaneously, this transforms of the latent heat is also could be registered by satellites. There is some products in, in the uh, some NASA sites uh, which give you direct, directly the latent heat fluxes of a special region, and we able to detect this latent heat fluxes before many many earthquakes for example before sumatra earthquake the total energy integrated for the four days uh, Which sumatra, the, the sumatra 2004, 2004 2004 the total thermal energy released before the sumatra earthquake one order of magnitude was higher than the mechanical energy released during the earthquake itself. So you can imagine what a huge power is inside and the simple thing is the water web. From what uh, 
people ask from what, uh, what is the source? It is the sun. Sun prepares this water vapor because we have content, uh, constant evaporation of humid from, from the rivers, from lakes, from source. And all the time we have this water vapor which contains this latent heat and during condensation it is released. So the source of this energy is the sun. So, but uh, now we come into electromagnetic. So, uh, uh, these thermal anomalies could be registered not only in the form of the heat like we measure by temperature, yes, but as a radiative heat, as an infrared radiation, which is in electromagnetic spectrum uh, with the wavelengths from 8 to 12 microns. This is a window which is transparent for the clouds. And it is possible to measure even through the clouds. And what is doing Dr. Ozunov, it is measure this uh, infrared emission at the top of atmosphere. It is something like from 8 to 12 kilometers. Under the ionosphere? No, I, it is under the no, ionosphere is much higher. It's under it is 10 to 12 kilometers okay. altitude. And uh, there were elaborated the very uh, precise and special techniques using the uh, measurements of previous, for example, for NOAA 20 years. We have very good background. And from this background, we are able to estimate that in this place. Sorry, so these, these, uh, these precursors are these, are these phenomena you've been 20 years? Uh, no, 20 years we have background of measurements to, to, to calculate the anomaly having this background. All right. We started our study more or less 10 years ago, uh -huh. according to this. And we are able to uh, see the dynamics of the development of these heat anomalies uh, on the top of atmosphere before the earthquake. These uh, anomalies uh, usually appear a few days before the earthquake. And uh, there are specific features that they are sitting over the area of the earthquake preparation. They can move a little bit exactly along the tectonic plates border or along the active tectonic fault, but are very close to the future epicenter. So this is the first a very reliable signature of the approaching uh, earthquake. And now we have very good statistics, very good score for this, uh, for all recent major earthquakes we have the data showing the appearance of this OLR, uh, OLR anomaly, which is outgoing long wave radiation, OLR, for all, uh, uh, without any exclusion, we see over ocean, inland, near the shore, not depending where this epicenter. It is advantage in comparison with any other techniques of the precursors because many of these precursors could be detected only in land. But because we deal with the gas which could be released from water as well, we see anomalies over the water. You can see here, 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 anomalies sitting all over the water. What instrumentations do you use to, to measure this? It is uh, um, infrared sensors which are installed on the majority of remote sensing satellites. They like have them. like NOAA satellites, Aqua, Terra, uh, it is a modest device, AVHRR in NOAA satellite and similar devices, for example, on, on both the Russian Meteor satellite, we have the similar device. Uh, European satellites, every uh, remote sensor satellite now has a infrared sensor and we need the frequency band or 
a wavelength band between the 8 and 12 microns. Now uh, we are going upper in the upper layers, it is uh, ionosphere. Ionosphere, it is a part of our atmosphere, but uh, partly ionized. Uh, its ionization comes from, uh, mainly from ultraviolet radiation emitted by our sun. Uh, uh, some part is uh, ionized by the X-rays and energetic particles. But the main, main source of the ionization, it is ultraviolet radiation. So because we have uh, radiation only during daytime, we uh, have increase of ionization during daytime and decrease during nighttime, and uh, uh, the variations of electron concentration look like sinusoidal, you can see in daily variations. And it is studied for many, many years. We have very good models which explain the climatology of the, beha of the ionospheric behavior. We also know very well the behavior in the sphere uh, during the active solar events like solar flares, geomagnetic storms. For uh, any point, uh, we have the regional models which can uh, explain what will be behavior of the ionosphere during geomagnetic storms. So we know the behavior of the ionosphere during quiet time condition and during geomagnetically disturbed condition. And starting from this, we are looking on some anomalies with, which are associated with the earthquake. How these anomalies in general can appear in the ionosphere. We were talking about the... You mean, so, because there could be different sources for... No, the, the source is the same. Because when... That would be... You, you, just, you, yeah, yes, I, 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 I will explain. Uh, we live in electrical environment. We never think about this. But uh, when you are standing here, it is a vertical electric field which has gradient 100 or 150 volts per meter. So between top of your head <laughs> and your legs, you have potential difference 220 <laughs> volts, like, 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 it's a, the, like, like a power source. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the problem is that the conductivity of air is very low. So the current which we have inside the atmosphere is 10 power minus 12 ampere, uh, ampere per square meter. What is, this, what is the source of this potential difference? We have potential difference between the ground and ionosphere. This potential difference is created by the thunderstorm activity. All over the world we have the global thunderstorm activity in Africa, in uh, America. Mainly thunderstorm activity is over the land. But it's not so important. The thunderstorm discharges provide the uh, positive potential of the ionosphere uh, in relation to the Earth. And we have the potential difference between the ground and ionosphere, something like 250 up to 500 kilovolts. And this potential difference is uh, dropped uh, in the, this bulk of atmosphere of, from ground surface up to more or less 60 kilometers. For this global electric circuit, usually they take the lower border of ionosphere near 60 kilometers. But the most potential drop we have in so-called boundary layer of atmosphere. Boundary layer, it is the layer we, where we have turbulent motion of the air. In the upper layers, it, we have no such turbulent motion. It is uh, uh, continuous gradient uh, uh, with 
without mixing, which we have in the ground. And so you can imagine you have potential difference, you have a resistor, what is the, our atmosphere. Okay. And if you change the value of this resistor, it means if you change the conductivity of this layer near ground layer and this conductivity is changed by appearance of this ions produced by a robot. First you will observe the increase of conductivity and then when th these ions grow and become a large clusters which are not moving it cannot uh, carry the uh, electrical current you will have the drop of conductivity like for example in in the uh, sand storms when you have a lot of sand uh, and uh, dirty for example in dirty cities the electric field larger than the in open field because uh, due to presence of, of the dust and aerosols the uh, conductivity drops. The same thing when you have formation of these large clusters, which were spoken before, the drop of conductivity leads to change of the uh, ionospheric potential related to the Earth. Okay. So, ionosphere feels the earthquakes through the Effect electric, through the electric, global electric security, through the, the change of conductivity of atmosphere. Okay. But the ionosphere is highly conductive medium. It uh, tries to maintain its equipotentiality. If you have a good conductor, it, all, all, all the parts of this conductor are at the same electrical potential. Okay. If something changes the sphere, it tries to uh, re uh, redistribute the electron concentration in ions to maintain its equipotential. What means redistribute? So their appearance, the drift or electric currents within the ionosphere and you have a formation of irregularity over the area where you have anomaly of conductivity. That's what so, you've been talking about with the total electron content. Yes. So, uh, and uh, parameters of the ionosphere could be measured by multitude of, of techniques. It is ground-based ba vertical sounding called ionosondes. Mm -hmm. We can put the same ionosond on the satellite and it, it will be topside ionospheric sound. Okay. You can measure the total electron content between the satellite and the ground. You can make the ionospheric tomography from, from the low orbit in satellites. So there are a lot of techniques. All of them were tested and all of them show the anomalies in the ionosphere. Okay. So also, okay, I have a book published in Springer, by Springer, uh, which named Ionospheric Precursors of Earthquake. You can find there. Okay everything explaining what, what, what is happening. But I also can say that also from the majority of earthquakes we see ionospheric anomalies which are very close to these thermal anomalies in their position. And in time they are also coherent. But we see propagation of these uh, anomalies from the ground surface up to the ionosphere. So Usually the ionospheric anomalies appears one day later or the same day as the term one. Now you have uh, on, on this poster here uh, the uh, some things related to the, specifically to the, to the 9.0 earthquake in Japan. Yes, it was a very difficult case for analysis uh, uh, for many reasons. One of them that uh, earthquake happened between two geomagnetic storms. Uh, uh, one of the indicator of the uh, geomagnetic storm, it is global equatorial geomagnetic index, which is named DST. 
continents. And this is a graph of this geomagnetic index. And when we have the sharp drop, this means the start of the geomagnetic storm. And then we have recovery phase. We have quiet geomagnetic condition, and then the next storm, right. which happened exactly in the moment of the earthquake. Mm -hmm. So that's that's sort of very interesting. Because yes, that sort of brings up that, as with a lot of a lot of these things that we can't see directly, it requires that we need a broader range of sensory instruments as possible to to correlate and make sure that we can annihilate things that don't okay. have things. Okay, correlation of solar and geomagnetic no, activity with, with seismic activity is very difficult task because because maybe there's statistically we, uh, some people show the existence of the correlation other people show that there is no correlation it should be uh, carried out very careful study of this but I can confirm that very often it happens that geomagnetic storm is very close to the uh, mm -hmm. earthquake and so but Mr. Duma uh, said something about that yes yesterday. yes but uh, uh, it, we cannot say that geomagnetic storm uh, earthquake no mm -hmm. sometimes geomagnetic storms c could be f one two days before the earthquake sometimes after sometimes one two days after sometimes like we have here simultaneously with mm -hmm. the earthquake so it looks like we have the common source of origin which provokes both these events and they have appear in the, That's interesting. In this, in the close time. Mm -hmm. But uh, why we, for example, uh, interpret this like a precursor? Because here this effect of the geomagnetic storm, which is blue, should decay because here we have quiet condition. But contrary to our expectation, we have the sharp growth of electron concentration. On 8th of March, it is three days before the earthquake. And this is supported, the GPS tech, supported by the uh, uh, ionospheric tomography, which is uh, another technique to study the ionosphere it is a low orbiting satellite and uh, they have the uh, two frequency transmitter on board and you put on the ground like a line or chain of receivers which receive the uh, satellite signal and you can from this registration reconstruct the vertical cross-section of the atmosphere in the plane of the satellite orbit. Uh -huh. it, it like tomography. You have many, many rays between the satellite and several receivers. Okay. And you process by tomography technique this multitude of rays and reconstruct from this by special uh, uh, mathematical procedure the, uh, the vertical structure. And this is a tomography reconstructions uh, uh, for the chain which is told on the Sakhalin region, uh, Sakhalin island of Russia, which is very close to the northern part of Japan. These receivers belong to the corporation Russian Space Systems. Our quarters, uh, Romanov are responsible for this result. And they also observe the large positive anomaly and again on 8th of March. So okay. we have completely different techniques with GPS tech. This is a tomography and they uh, demonstrate the same thing. And next one, it is uh, the ground-based ionosons. Ionoson, it is a radar working in the uh, short wave frequency band from 1 to 20 megahertz. It is broadcasting. And they actually were designed... Is this what is called the very low frequency? No, no, it is not, not a very low. Sorry, what it is HF, HF, high frequency band. Okay. Uh, they are designed 
to I didn't, I didn't catch the number. Just pre can you, can you predict the hertz number? From one megahertz oh, yeah. to 20 megahertz. Okay. Mm -hmm. They were designed to monitor and predict the propagation of radio waves. Okay. When we, we had no VHF uh, uh, broadcasting and FM broadcasting in the 30s, 40s, 50s of last century, mm -hmm. the broadcasting was in the HF wave band. And these uh, devices were designed especially to monitor the state of the ionosphere to predict the pr uh, radio wave propagation in this frequency band. And uh, now they used to monitor the space weather because ionosphere is very sensitive to solar effects. And uh, every country has an, its own network of the ionosphere. Here in Japan, we have four ionospheric stations. Wakanai, Kokobunji, it is in Tokyo. Yamagawa and Okinawa. There's four ionospheric stations. Here you have their coordinates. And we were able to elaborate the technique which shows that due to specific, uh, specific variability of the ionosphere before the earthquake, when you have station close to the epicenter and try to correlate this station which with other station which is far from epicenter the cross correlation coefficient drops before the earthquake and this is a cross correlation coefficient between the kokobunji which is close to the epicenter mm -hmm. and yamagawa station which is far from the epicenter so we have just the configuration described in our publication okay. and Again, on 8th of March, we see the drop of cross-correlation coefficient, like in GPS tag and ionospheric tomography. So three independent techniques mm -hmm. show the same for this earthquake. Mm -hmm. So three days before three days. main, uh, before the main show. And the last result, we uh, try to compare, so it's the same season, for example, of the year, mm -hmm. and mainly, more or less, for the same solar activity, because the ionospheric uh, density depends on the solar activity. But the, uh, last year, this year, not differed too much in this. So we took the variations of the electron concentration for year 2010, for period from 23rd of March to uh, 23rd of February to 23rd of March, and uh, for year 2011, for all four ionospheric stations, and simply we subtracted from 2011 the 2010 date. So they have, uh, and this is the difference. So can you just in, say quickly where, what the, where the origin is of the uh, what's originating the uh, the high frequency waves? Uh, this is uh, I, I told you this wave I emitted it is uh, like a radar. It uh, it is installation. It sends pulses to the ionosphere and obtains the reflection. Okay, so th and that's what these four. Uh, yes, yes, and. Uh, on the different frequencies, where the radar is, is not no, 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 no. Different frequencies are reflected of, on the different altitudes of the ionosphere. Mm -hmm. The higher electron density, the uh, higher frequency you need to reflect from the ionosphere. Okay. So the ionosphere is uh, starting to send pulses from one megahertz and goes up to twenty, and receives the reflections from the ionosphere. And, and specific frequency, which is named critical frequency, ionosphere is not able more to reflect the radio waves and they pass through. Okay. And this frequency is named critical. And mm -hmm. this is a my main parameters uh, okay. used by the ionosphere, and we use just the critical frequency, which reflects the maximum electron concentration in the ionosphere. Mm -hmm. So, from year 2011, 
we subtract 2010, okay? And you can see it starting from something like 5th of March, right. increase and then decrease. And this is a moment of the earthquake. Right. So this is a, from north to south, Wakanai, Kokobunji, Yamagawa, Okinawa. Pretty big spike. Yes. Pretty. And Okinawa, then it, it, Okinawa, it's, uh, Okinawa is a bit more erratic. But uh, uh, yes, but uh, Okinawa, it is, it is low latitudes, which are affected by uh, so-called equatorial anomaly, which uh, appears in the equatorial uh, ionosphere. Okay. So uh, it's a little bit <laughs> much higher variability than on the mid latitude. So, uh, what I would like to underline more, okay. that uh, our approach, it is a multi-parameter analysis. Uh, we can say that it's very difficult, almost impossible, to make some kind of prediction using only one parameter. For example, thermal, ionospheric, VLF propagation, and so on and so on. But if you have something like we name synergy of the processes, we see that all of them are connected and show the same area with the same time interval. Mm -hmm. And we see some development of the processes starting from the ground surface, like the uh, surface temperatures and air temperatures and top of atmosphere and ionosphere. And we see this dynamic all this complex of the effect, mm -hmm. we may say that this is a multi-parameter precursor for the Earth. Mm -hmm. This is our approach. And it's interesting because you noted that also so, with the with the geomagnetic storms poses the question: Well, where's the physical cause? That still needs to be investigated. Yes. Where's the where's the principled cause? But just one thing and I wanted to say because uh, Professor Biaggi was saying that their main problem is they just don't have enough sensors. Like they have very few sensors. Through Europe, there's only seven, and if you had a global, uh, you know, global array of these things, then they could be looking where, where this all the things are happening around the world. This is a difference between ground-based measurements and satellite. Yeah, you were saying you don't. That with you satellite, have we have a global picture without okay. exclusion. This is an advantage. You, okay, you're saying you have the instrumentation. Yes. Is yes. that right? Do you, Yes, of course, we because should... Because right uh, now we're seeing that NASA is getting huge cuts to its budget. Um, there was the, uh, the case of the... It's very pretty because <laughs> we uh, can develop uh, this technology and uh, many other countries uh, try to build their own satellites. Mm -hmm. For example, China now is on the way building specific aim-directed satellite to measure electromagnetic precursors of earthquakes to be launched in 2014. 14. 14, yes. But I think, looking from the perspective what we have now in Japan, how tragic event, how many people in so developed country, okay, we can say that, when you, when you have few, uh, but this demonstrates that nature has no difference between the poor and rich country, developed, not developed. We cannot fight with nature. We cannot overcome. It's very strong and disastrous event. So we need to make the urgent actions. But we cannot, to, but we can understand. We, we the is the, to uh, start our activity now, we have demonstrated that we are able at, at least to make some kind of warnings. We not say about prediction, but we can say that in this area, in nearest few days, we expect the, uh, some seismic shock and we are able to even to estimate the future 
Negan. Mm -hmm. So, just of course, just many, clarify, many, many, many things are not clear, but we cannot uh, prolongate in infinity our investigation. How many victims we need to continue our investigation? I think it's very important. I think it's clear with the, with the amount of victims uh, we have we, that we, we have we to do it right now. Yes. That we should we, 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 we can The uh, question uh, that I have to you that on that specifically is do you have, are the, one, are all the instrumentations there in place that you need? And if you didn't have money restrictions, what would you want to see implemented so that you could immediately begin setting up things that we could use to, to recognize precursors all around the world, every nation along the rim of fire and beyond. What would you need for that? Okay. Uh, in present moment, we have quite enough the remote sensing satellites. And we, uh, in many countries, including the United States, have the plans, for, uh, for example, in POIS uh, pro uh, uh, project, to launch more satellites in, uh, having on board the infrared sensors. So there was one called the uh, uh, one D is yes, deny destiny, which was supposed to measure. Uh, I'm not sure. I can't remember the acronym, but that was a, a satellite that was that was cut. That was uh, actually not launched. I'm then you had the GOES 11, which was launched, I think, but they didn't have a ground crew to analyze the data. So it's up there doing stuff, but. You don't have people analyzing the data. And one thing you mentioned before is that it's you've done this work, but there's only so much that you know, yes. two or three people. Uh, can do. In, in, in principle, we can start now if we will have at least some specific laboratory with okay with the staff more or less. I estimate like ten people. It's mm -hmm. enough to start to analyze the data on infrared, GPS tech, VLF uh, propagation. Uh, it is enough to do some kind of warning at least of some areas like California, Japan, Mediterranean, Mexico. We have enough instrumental means it does not mean that we should not stop, it should not develop uh, the, the, uh, and other types of measurements uh, and increase our ground-based network. But we should take a, as an example the medicine, for example, the problem of cancer. Mm -hmm. It was thought that it is impossible to overcome. Then the doctors start to one kind of cancer now is treatable. The second one, and it is expanding. Mm -hmm. Because people do not stop. They are doing what they, are, what they can to do in the present moment. Right. And we should do the same. Mm -hmm. We should do with what we can to do in the present moment. Mm -hmm. But in present moment, we need some support because we are very few. We are under pressure of from different sources for different reasons. Mm -hmm. We need to be live in quite good conditions to work, to have more uh, human resources. I said something like 10 people laboratory. And I'm sure that we are now able to make a good progress improving this technology and elaborated the <coughs> techniques, especially application techniques for the short-term work. This is great. What? You, uh, you basically answered all my questions. I have just one more because uh, I think um, Ben sent you some material on the kind of work that they've been looking into, um, especially looking at the records of um, fossil fossil records showing biodiversity, um, volcanic activity from volcanic rock over just what we have, which shows some very clear cycles of um, 60 to 62 million years of increase and decrease of biodiversity and also increase volcanic activity around the same time. Um, and because you mentioned that there's also now these 
also the phenomena of the geomagnetic increased activity, which goes along with the things that you guys are measuring with some some kind of phase shift, maybe. Um, have you, just as a sort of free question, you know, has there been okay. any thought, any look, look, uh, any thoughts to look into that? That there's maybe an increase in general sensitivity within a longer time frame. Okay. Due to due to some external yes. sources. What we know from historical data. Um, let's start from the short periods. Uh, for example, mounder minimum mm -hmm. of the solar activity. So in uh, 16th and 17th century, you know that in Holland we had ice. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of literature showing that people ice skating, uh, ice skating and so and now we have very warm. And from historical measurements of the solar activity, we have seen that it was very low, extremely low, not uh, at all the 11, like we say, 11 uh, years solar cycle activity. Uh, what we observe now, we had extremely long period of low solar activity. It was not predicted by anybody. Mm -hmm. we, had the, we, we had minimum uh, which lasts at least two years or up to three years longer than it was expected. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the one reason uh, there is some variability in activity of our star which provides the life in the Earth. The second, uh, which is uh, more important and probably may have more grave consequences, it is a reversals of the geomagnetic field. Mm -hmm. From paleogeomagnetic data, uh, we have uh, seen that the polarity of geomagnetic field was changed several times during the history of our planet. Mm -hmm. And this transition period is very uh, dangerous because uh, during transition we will have some period nobody knows how long it will be when we have almost no geomagnetic field. In the no polarity. Is that what you uh, mean? Yes, yes. It, it is flipping in flux in uh, yes hmm. and uh, this geomagnetic field protects us from yeah. the extremely solar uh, energetic particles cosmic and deflect de and cosmic rays it deflects it there and we will have some period when the geomagnetic field of the earth will be very low and this uh, give make um, may give rise to, to the changes of <laughs> biodiversity of uh, our planet. Mm -hmm. This is a, another. So, uh, uh, if we will not talk about periodicity, we have such events like asteroids and so on, encountering with our planet, which can produce huge uh, devastation and changing of our environment. But it is not periodic stochastic and another uh, periodic changes it is a movement of our solar system through the arms of our galactic uh, inside the arms we have the larger concentration of matter and so the lower flux of the cosmic rays and we know that cosmic rays do have effect on the cloud coverage and the temperature on our planet so uh, there are some theories I not developed this but I have seen publications that just ice period uh, and uh, higher temperature periods uh, 
uh, were changed with the periodicity of passing of solar systems through the arms of the galactics. Between the arms, we have lower, so higher flux of cosmic rays. Inside the arm, lower flux of the cosmic rays. This is another source of the variability. But all these things are more speculations than the science. We should make more investigation to say something different. But your question was, what I think about this. I, yeah. I, I told you about the pos possible reasons, uh, possible reasons, of of, of periodicity. Mm -hmm. We can start with life. Moon. We can start with Moon and Mars, looking if there's a seismic activity there. Be interesting to see if there's a similar activity right now on other pla planets. Yes, but it is not so easy. <laughs> no. But uh, that's, yes, uh, that's, you, that's you human civilization. You are young, so before you have before more interesting information, and probably next probes would be able to, to investigate other planets of our depends, system. It depends if, if we have politicians who just keep spending money on bank bailouts and not on science and uh, investigating uh, the solar system, then we have a definite yes. problem <laughs> for that perspective. All right, thanks okay. very much. Thank you. Thank you.